Have you ever heard someone say that if we stopped eating meat and all became vegetarians and ate only plants, that we could feed everybody on the planet or that we could save the world? Is there any truth to this? What's the science behind it? Well, in this video, we're going to explore that. We're going to talk about energy flow in an ecosystem and the possibility that we should all become vegetarians. Let's get started. So in this video, we're going to talk about energy. So we want to start by talking about why organisms need energy in the first place. So obviously, organisms need energy to grow. You may remember we do a lot of mitosis. That's growth, right? Your cells grow, they divide, a lot of mitosis, we get bigger, we need more cells, we grow. Organisms need a lot of energy to grow. We also need energy to reproduce. If we're not passing on our genes to the next generation through the process of reproduction, then our species would die out. So we need energy to also reproduce. And then another really big part of the energy use for organisms is that we need to maintain organization. We need to maintain also homeostasis. So it's these things and a few more that require a lot of energy for organisms. So in this podcast, we're going to talk a lot about this energy use and how it transfers through different systems. So the first one I want to mention is maintaining body temperature. So if you think about it, there are different strategies that animals or organisms have evolved to regulate their body temperature and their metabolism, right? That's breaking down food, that's breaking down uh, chemicals into other chemicals or building up other chemicals. So this process of metabolism and maintaining our body temperature um, works a few different ways. For endothermic animals like us, we use um, energy to maintain homeostasis. But exothermic animals, uh, like a lizard, uses external thermal energy to regulate their temperature. So if you think about a walrus and another little mammal, maybe a little mouse, we're endotherms. So if you look at the word, if you think therm, temperature, energy, endo, inside. So we maintain our own temperature internally, right? So by breaking things down, getting heat from our food source, that, is help, that helps us maintain homeostasis. Now, if you don't do that, if you don't maintain your body temperature internally, you have to do it externally. Think of insects and a lot of reptiles. So you may look here in this picture, if you had some turtles that you were keeping, you'd probably have to have a heat lamp in their little aquarium or in their um, space so that they could keep warm because reptiles, insects, they are exothermic. Their temperature, therm, is regulated externally. And so here's a little chart that sort of shows that. You might see lizards or snakes sunning during the day, right? So their temperature has to change throughout the day based on the external temperature. So they might come out at a certain time to get different amounts of heat energy from the sun or at night to cool off, depending on the season. So those are the two main strategies, endothermic, internally maintaining temperature, exothermic, relying on the environment to maintain the temperature. So speaking of metabolic rate, there is a relationship between metabolic rate and per unit body mass of an organism. All right, let's talk, what is metabolic rate? So our metabolic rate is how much energy we're using per time. So you may have heard someone say, oh, they've got a fast metabolism. That just means they're breaking down their food faster, they're using a lot of energy per time. Now, in general, the smaller the organism, the higher the metabolic rate. Now, that doesn't necessarily make sense to you. You think, oh man, a big blue whale, that's probably got to have a huge metabolic rate, rate to transfer all that food or to transfer all that energy, break down that in food into energy. Not necessarily true. What we find is that the smaller the organism, 
the higher the metabolic rate per body mass unit. Okay, so this can be a little tricky. So I made a little graph here to help explain that. So if we make a graph, and on the bottom we're putting per kilogram of body mass. All right, so per kilogram of body mass. And over here, we're gonna put metabolic rate. So we're comparing metabolic rate to per kilogram of body mass. And if we were to draw this out, what we'd see is that the smaller organisms, all right, have a higher metabolic rate per kilogram of body mass. So let's just say this organism was three kilograms. For each of those three kilograms of mass, each of those has a very high metabolic rate. And what we find is that as organism size increases, right, from a shrew up to a field mouse, up to a squirrel, notice that things start to change. The bigger the organism, dog, human doing some research, searching for something, and then elephant, the per kilogram body mass relates to metabolic rate in that the metabolic rate goes down per kilogram of body mass for these larger organisms. Now, does that mean, you gotta be careful here. So you, are we saying that a shrew has a higher metabolism than an elephant? Well, it's not that simple. You can't just say it like that, but the elephant's got a lot more mass. And if you took every kilogram of the mass of an elephant, that would in general have a lower metabolic rate than the total metabolic rate per each kilogram for the shrew. So the smaller the organism, the higher the metabolic rate per body mass. And what is, why is this? Well, scientists, um, it's still a little unclear, but we think it probably has to do with the surface area to volume ratio. Obviously, the larger the organism, the greater the volume, less surface area. A small thing, like the shrew, has a greater surface area to volume ratio, right? So they've got a lot more surface compared to their volume than here. They've got a lot more volume, this elephant, compared to their surface area. So we think because the surface area and maybe there's so much more surface area exposed, the heat might leak out more. Leaks maybe not the word, but it might dissipate more then they have to have a higher me metabolic rate to keep their temperature um, compared to something like an elephant where there's so much volume internally, they're gonna be able to keep that temperature what it needs to be without losing a lot of excess heat. So in terms of energy efficiency, how have organisms evolved to be more efficient, right? We need energy, we talked about all the reasons we need energy, but how have organisms evolved to be efficient at keeping that organism or at keeping that energy? One of the ways we've done it is to compartmentalize. Think about human body systems, right? You've got a circulatory system, you've got a nervous system. Why all these systems? Why can't every, why doesn't everything is just one big mass of cells? Well, actually it's more efficient when we specialize. So the body systems help us be more efficient. This system transfers blood. Another system is about um, support, right? The, the muscular system is about movement. So by compartmentalizing systems and organs, we keep energy more efficiently. So we don't need every single organ to pump blood, but this one's pretty efficient at it. We also have cells that are specialized. Some cells transfer information, some cells transfer oxygen. Cell specialization and compartmentalization is also helping with energy efficiency. And then even within a cell, compartmentalization of functions is more efficient. So you've got the mitochondria, powerhouse of the cell, or site of oxidative phosphorylation for us AP Bio students. We know that this is more efficient if we're making the ATP in these mitochondria than having it made in several different locations, right? So the efficiency of energy has been very important for organisms to evolve over time. So how does energy transfer through an ecosystem? Well, we all know the ultimate source of energy is the sun. That sun provides producers the energy to grow and thrive. Then that energy is 
transferred to the next generation. But before it can be transferred, believe it or not, all the energy put into the plants is not totally converted to raw plant material. Because as this indicates, we lose some energy. So the producers, the plants, they grow. And then what eats the producers? Well, the primary consumers, also known as herbivores. They eat the plants. And as before, 100% of this energy is not transferred to the next generation. We actually lose some energy through the process. And we'll go over that more in just a moment. Then what eats the primary consumers? Of course, the secondary consumers, also known as carnivores. So this is a general um, food chain, a general way that we transfer energy through ecosystems. Um, in the next few slides, I'm gonna get a little more specific and we'll go through um, a specific example. So here is a food chain. What is a food chain? It's basically showing the trophic levels, the energy levels as food moves throughout a chain. And it shows the relationships between feeding. This organism feeds on this organism, feeds on this organisms, um, or on this organism. It all starts, of course, with energy from the sun. So we've got some sun. The rays from the sun, the energy from the sun are gonna help plants grow. The plants are known, of course, as the producers. They are producing life. They are producing sugar, producing matter from the energy of the sun. We call this level one because it's primary. It's at the bottom. Um, another word for producers is autotrophs. If you think auto, that means self. So trophic levels feeding, they feed their self. Um, they don't have to eat other things. So then, what eats the producer? Well, that would be level two, our primary consumer. And in this case, we've got a nice grasshopper. It's gonna come, it's gonna eat some of the grass. And the primary consumer, we might call a heterotroph because it, hetero means other, it has to feed on others. So the producers, they didn't. They relied on themselves and the sun's energy to feed. Primary consumer, like, like you see here, they rely on others. So the primary consumer had to eat the producer. You might also hear the word herbivore because these primary consumers oft, often only eat plants, only eat herbs, so to speak. Then we go to our level three. This would be our secondary consumer, like a field mouse. Mouse eats the grasshopper, which eats the grass. So because this consumer, the secondary consumer, is eating another heterotroph, we would call them a carnivore. They're eating more than just plants. And then finally, and this can go on forever, but in this diagram, we're just gonna take it to level four. We have a tertiary consumer, right? The tertiary consumer eating the secondary, et cetera, et cetera all started with energy from the sun that came down. Now, what then happens? Because we learned in previous videos that the energy is constant from the sun, but these other nutrients, these other um, necessities for life are in limited supply, so they have to be recycled. So our top carnivore eats the secondary, eats the primary, when all of these things die, or when our top carnivore dies, it has to then go back into the earth. So another important relationship in this food chain is that of the decomposers. The mushrooms, the fungus, the bacteria, that then will break down any leftover material and it all returns back to the earth, right? So anything that was left over, when it dies, is gonna return back to the earth. The fungi, the bacteria will help to break that down. So then that the cycle can continue. The producers, the autotrophs can use those nutrients and resources to grow. So another important thing to consider in this food chain is that a change in the free energy can result in a disruption to this ecosystem. So if there's a change in sunlight, for example, right? this whole ecosystem can be thrown off. Or if something happens to the, one of these lower producers, if something affects all the plants in an area, that's gonna affect everything else in the food chain. 
So these food chains rely on this free energy available from the sun and then from lower organisms in the food chain. So let's get back to what we started the whole video with, this idea of losing energy between each uh, food level transfer. And so transfer of energy between levels of a food chain is very inefficient we lose energy between every level. So, you know, we've got the sun, right? The sun gives us energy, the plant grows. Okay, so now we've got a plant. Well, let's have a consumer come in. Okay, there's a little caterpillar they're gonna eat. And once they've eaten some of the leaf, that energy essentially transferred into the caterpillar. But did 100% of that available energy transfer to the caterpillar? No, it only got a little bigger. It only grew a little bit. Why is that? Why is energy transfer so inefficient? Well, if you think about it, back to our very beginning slide, all energy is not used for growth. Some of it is waste, right? If you think about some of this that's eat, some of the um, insect will leave it as poop, as waste, so that energy from the leaf, some of it was lost to waste. Then the organism itself has to have make, make its own energy. So a lot of that energy is lost to the process of cellular respiration. So we say that these, are, these two things are energy lost to daily living. It just takes energy for daily living. And then roughly only 10% of that leaf that was eaten by the caterpillar actually goes to its growth. We actually call this the 10% rule. The idea that roughly, and, right, and this is an estimate, roughly 10% of energy is transferred to the next level of the food chain. So what happened to the rest? Well, it's the cost of living. 90% of that energy that was available was lost just through the process of living. So energy transfer is not very efficient. And we can actually chart this out. So I just took the food chain here and put it here. And let's look and let's just have some numbers. Let's say that at our very bottom level from the sun, there were 10,000 joules of potential energy in all this grass, right? There's a lot of energy that was available. Well, when the primary consumers eat it, not all of that 10,000 joules gets moved up into the um, growth of those new organisms, only 10%. So we go from 10,000 up to 1,000, okay? So then 1,000 joules is now available in the grasshopper population, okay? So here come secondary consumers, the mice, they're gonna eat them, 10% of that moves up. Then tertiary consumer comes and eats, only 10%. Now look at what has happened. As we go up the food chain, you notice this sort of pyramid thing happening. We started with a ton of available energy, but by the time it moved through each organism, a very small fraction was left because we lose roughly 90% or only 10% is kept in each level up the food chain. So we go back to my very first introduction where I said, well, should we all be vegetarian? Well, I'm not gonna give you a decision on that. I'm gonna let you make up your own mind. But if you look scientifically, if we are eating a tertiary consumer or a secondary consumer, or even a primary consumer, the total available energy from the plants was lost because think of if you're eating a cow or a pig, think of how much it had to eat and you only got, the pig only got 10% of that, and then you're only gonna get 10% of the energy from the pig or the cow. From a scientific standpoint, it does make sense, right? If more people were to eat directly from the producer level, there'd be a lot more energy available. There'd be a lot more food available um, for the population. Um, now, uh, I'm not gonna give you any moral reasons. I'll let you make up your own mind on that. But there is some scientific validity to these ideas. Okay, so how could we measure this if we wanted to measure the change? We could actually do a lab. We could measure the net primary productivity, right? 
um, which is just the, the primary change, the net change in productivity for a different ecosystem. And so in a terrestrial one, one on land, we could just measure the change in biomass. Well, what's biomass? Right, the mass of living things. One of the important things you got to remember, though, when you're doing these problems, or if you were going to do a lab or you're going to measure this stuff, you've got to remember to remove water from the biomass because that's not technically living material. So let me give you an example of a lab we could set up. Let's say we wanted to measure the primary productivity or how energy flows through a butterfly. So we would start with a nice butterfly egg, okay? We could mass that if we wanted, but eventually, What's going to happen? We're going to get a caterpillar, right? And that caterpillar is in its larva stage. And what's going to happen is that caterpillar is going to come up and probably eat some of this leaf, OK? As it eats the leaf, we could measure how much it ate. So we could mass the leaf before. We could see how much it ate. And then we could mass the change in the caterpillar to see if what percentage of the leaf actually became part of the caterpillar. Then it will go into its pupa stage. So over time, we can measure and see how much is now in the pupa. It started here, now it's here. What's the mass? Remember, you got to account for and remove any water. And see how efficient was the removal of um, that particular energy from this level. And then, of course, we could do the same thing once we got the butterfly. Now, it's going to be hard to mass all of these things. Um, some would be easier than others. But if you think about it, we could literally measure in a lab the transfer of energy by taking what they ate and seeing how much they grow and see how much energy level was or how much energy was lost through this process, and we can measure the primary productivity. So if you want to do a lab and measure this, certainly a way that you could do it. So the last thing I want to talk about is food webs as we wrap this up. When we take several ch food chains, link them together, we make a food web. So a food web is a complicated web of all the different food chains in a particular system. Okay, so why, why well, I got a picture here of me at Venice. And the reason is, is because I'm gonna show you the food web in the marine ecosystem around Venice. This has been studied quite a bit, it's pretty fascinating. There's actually living things. You know, we go and we visit and we take pictures and all this fun stuff, but there's actually an entire food web in this marine ecosystem. All right, so let's look at it. So if we take a look here at the food web, you can see this is, this is looking pretty crazy. There's a lot going on in there, right? You see the trophic levels, the feeding levels over here. And then at the very bottom, right, you see sort of our primary producers. See some grass, some epiphytes, some sort of algae. This is going to provide the primary level of food for other things to eat. Now, if you take a look then up at the second level, right, you see all those macrobenthos, right? Some detritivores, which are getting food from sediments and things like that. You can see a lot of plankton at the secondary level, filter feeder, feeders, clams, etc. So we can sort of go up, but you see how complicated this is because different things might eat different things, right? So the clams here can be eaten directly from harvesting from people that come and harvest the clams, or the clam can also be eaten by some of these fish. And so you at this particular sea bream, sea bream fish. Um, and so what is a food web? Basically a food web is just an attempt to link all the chains together in a pretty complex ecosystem. Now one thing you might notice is that there's some different colors here. And you really have to look at your particular food web. Um, but I get this question a lot, what, what do the colors mean? Well, for many food webs, the colors signify the different levels. So you might have the green down here, which is often sort of from a primary producer standpoint. Um, and then you can see blue might be a, more of a top level uh, secondary consumer. You really have to look at the particular food web um, and whoever drew it and 
and maybe see if they gave you a key to it. But often the colors do mean different things and they correspond to different trophic levels. Okay, so hopefully in this video you learned a few things about how energy transfers within an ecosystem and maybe it will give you some second thought about what you eat and where that energy is going and where it came from and what's the total energy and total food supply for us on this planet. Hopefully you enjoyed this video and learned something. If you did, like and subscribe to continue more videos.